one of the more important aspects of data science is being able to clean the data. And we call this pre-processing of data. And it's necessary because every data set suffers from some of the following problems. Irrelevant fields, such as fields that are in a data set that don't have any value whatsoever towards our analysis. Redundancy, you might have a column that talks about web revenue and another column that talks about online revenue and they're in essence the same or very close to it. And so there may be some issues if you use both of those fields. The other one is missing values. So this is more common where you'll have a significant number of observations that will be missing certain columns of data. When I say significant, it could be a few percentage points, it wouldn't be the whole data set, but uh, in some cases, some fields are really poorly filled in. And the fourth one is outliers, where you'll actually have a uh, data point for an observation, but it seems to be either way out of bounds or a complete error. So this whole process is known as prepping or data prep, and it can take to 30%, sometimes even more, 40% of an entire project. But it is the most critical stage because if this step is incorrectly done, the problems will cascade through the entire project. Much of the pre-processing work should be done in a database and should be stored in tables or files for later use in automation. Normally, data in a company is stored in the database already. And what data analysts and data scientists will do is they will create a number of subtables to make it easier for ongoing analysis especially since much of the data is aggregated at different levels. And it can sometimes take hours to create new subsets. So we learn to create subsets upon subsets upon subsets. And therefore, it's pretty important for you to understand how to manipulate SQL. Missing data is a critical problem for almost every data scientist because not every data set is going to have complete data for observations. And this is very, very true in a lot of organizations that are trying to collect data from various sources, and they will have gaps in the data. So therefore, analysts must have a means to handle these records. Techniques for handling missing data include removing the observation completely. So if we're missing one of the columns of a particular observation, we might remove the whole observation. Now, you only want to do this if the number of missing data points really doesn't exceed 2% or 3%. If it starts getting into the 5% range, you may want to keep those observations and do something with the missing values within the observation. You can ignore only the missing information. So, for example, if you're doing an analysis and you don't necessarily need that column, I can keep the observation, but I'm removing the column from any analysis. We can replace the missing values with a given constant. So if we know that we're going to choose, say, a minimum or a maximum, we say we want a worst case scenario as a zero and a maximum value of 100 for another type of analysis, we can impute the information in a particular uh, item there. We can also replace the missing value with the expected value for the column or mean. So in other words, if we know that the column is going to uh, have some missing data, we can make a decision that says we will choose the mean or the median, a halfway point, and impute values for the missing observations for that column. We can also replace the missing value with a random number for the analyzed distribution of the column. If we know that a particular column follows a normal distribution, let's say with a mean of 88, as a, for example, a grade, with a standard deviation of 7 or 8, we could actually create a random number and plug it in there so that it fills in the gaps. And there are some advantages and disadvantages to doing this. And we can replace the values from imputed values based on characteristics of the observation. So in other words, if we know that the record missing is for a female, we might be able to choose a value associated with females as opposed to males. So there's a, many different ways that we can impute missing data in our data set. One of the more common problems that will occur in data is uh, misclassification or just typing errors in some cases. So consider we have tabulated entries here where states are filled in for observations. And on the right we see this table here that says NY 197, New York 1, NJ 201, New Jersey 2, CT 134, MA 112, and MS 1. These refer to the states and for those of you who are not familiar with the state abbreviations because you're um, from outside the United States, NY stands for New York, NJ stands for New Jersey, and the other three are other states in the United States, specifically in the Northeast. So we can see here that the NY and New York are similar, and there's only one 
where it's written out for New York. So we can then combine those two. We could say we're going to create a new column called actual state, then use either the term New York or the abbreviation NY, and we will then be able to aggregate that information. We can do the same thing with New Jersey because we see that we have 201 and 2 for the New Jersey word as written out. Then we have two other states, CT and MA, Connecticut and Massachusetts. The last one is interesting because the last one, MS, actually stands for Mississippi, which is in the south. What a data analyst might want to do is look at this data set particularly and say, well, all of my values seem to be related to states in the northeast and mid-Atlantic. Therefore, that MS is probably mistyped. And if you look at the keyboard, the S is close to the A, so it may have been a typo or typographical error. And so we might then decide, looking at that observation, that that MS really probably is erroneous and should be MA. Outlier detection is also important, and there are a couple ways that we can do this. We can do this graphically, which is fairly easy because in many cases our graphs will automatically provide what outliers are. And what they do is they use the statistical method known as two key fences to determine what are outliers within a particular category. And what it does is it uses the interquartile range and will pick a number, an inner fence which is 1.5 times the interquartile range, or three times the interquartile range. So it would have to be three times outside of the IQR or 1.5 times uh, outside the IQR. Now these are okay, however, in some cases, that may not work so well. And we'll give you an example here. So let's assume that you have a person who has a temperature of 102 degrees, and that's one of your observations. But all the rest of the observations are 98.6, 98.7, 98.5, and we have our mean of 98.6, but our standard deviation is only, let's say, 0.2 or 0.4. Well, if you were to compute the interquartile range for that, you'd find that 102 degrees is outside of the norm and is an outlier. The analyst has to make a determination as to whether or not that particular observation is truly an outlier. 102 degrees is a reasonable temperature to have. Obviously, someone is sick. However, if it was 112, that might be a different story, and that might be a typographical error or some other uh, sensor error. So it's important to not just utilize one method, but to observe the data as well.